One of the things that you know before you go there is that it's a country with a personality cult. There's pictures of grandfather, father and son, so that's Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-un, the current leader, absolutely everywhere. By the end of the week, I started to find it quite creepy, this sort of permanent smiles that you can challenge or question. Even just spending seven days inside a personality cult is quite overwhelming, quite disturbing. You have to accept reporting conditions there that you probably wouldn't accept anywhere else. You're constantly accompanied by minders, although they don't like being called minders. In our case, two very nice guys called Mr. Kim and Mr. Lee. <laughs> we were never officially told we couldn't go anywhere without them, but it was made pretty clear that we were not to leave the hotel. And they organized a very packed schedule from sort of early in the morning until late at night. <sighs> We went to a water park, to a zoo, to a fun fair, to a stamp museum. And it was sort of interesting because it felt very much like they were trying to show us a very specific image of ordinary life in Pyongyang. I think if you look at a lot of reporting from North Korea, it's often focused on sort of regimented mass events. And we'd actually asked to see some of that because that's obviously a big part of life in North Korea. People have to do a lot of stuff kind of in unison, but none of those requests were actually met. So we only saw the capital, which everybody who studies North Korea says is a different world from the rest of North Korea. It's a city of these quite almost surreal apartment blocks, and they seem to really love pastel colours. And it's all arranged so that real life happens round the back, so it's almost like the main streets are show fronts. <laughs> the bag factory was next to the back of one of these apartment blocks. So when we were going back to the bus, I just sort of wandered off to have a look. There were some people taking coal deliveries, there were some people with armbands sitting outside a little sign, maybe for a shop, selling things. So my first indication that this was maybe a little bit sensitive was two women started getting quite cross with me. And then the guides who'd been somewhere else came sort of running over and, and said, no, no, you can't take pictures here, you've got to get back on the bus. And I realised later that it's part of this sort of desire to show this very manicured, manufactured, perfected image of North Korean society and also maybe that they don't want you to sort of understand some of the details of control. I later found out that North Korea apparently has residence committees, usually older women, to check that their dress fits what North Korea's sort of unofficial standards consider acceptable. We were there for the anniversary of Kim Il-sung's birthday, which is known as the Day of the Sun, and it's something like a sort of North Korean Christmas, really. <laughs> North Koreans strenuously deny that it's a religion, but it has pretty much all the trappings of a religion, including even a kind of nativity myth. There's a village just on the outskirts of Pyongyang, which is meant to be where Kim Il-sung was born. The great-grandfather of the president was so poor, that he could not afford a house. So he became a gravekeeper and moved to this house in 1862. So under the wise leadership of our president Kim Il-sung and the great general Kim Il-sung, our country has become the strongest one of the world. Last year, as you know, we accomplished the course of perfecting our national nuclear forces thanks to the wise leadership of our respected Supreme Leader, Comrade Kim Jong. People go there to pay homage, to leave flowers. They would go to the well and drink some of the revolutionary water to make themselves revolutionary and put some of it into bottles and take it away. And then this little sort of uh, farmer's home, you see it reproduced all over the country in paintings, in posters. And while we were there, it was the centrepiece and the theme of the uh, Kim Il Sung Gya Kim Jong Il flower festival that happens every year in Pyongyang. North Koreans take these flowers really seriously. You can buy books of 
how to sort of identify a perfect Kim Il Sung era, perfect Kim Jong Il era in bloom. And uh, families are there, and everybody's sort of enjoying looking at the flowers, taking pictures of each other, taking pictures of their family. Mr. Kim and Mr. Lee, they wouldn't always translate things, so it soon became evident after sort of I think just a day or two that nobody in Pyongyang knew that Kim was planning to meet with Trump and whenever we tried to ask questions about that they would refuse to translate it or they would say this is not a time for asking political questions. They would never outright say nobody knows about this or you're not allowed to do it. They would just be incredibly evasive. Here's this summit that's billed as, as sort of crucial for world peace and you know, a big step that Kim is sort of talking up internationally, but domestically his own people have no idea that it's going to happen. You know, it gives you a sense of how incredibly shut off from the rest of the world people are there. We were taken to a lot of sort of places where people were having fun. And obviously at the back of your mind there's always a question, is all of this put on, is all of this a show for me? I feel like you did get a sense of life in Pyongyang. The thing that I felt I had to keep reminding myself of was this is a tiny portion of the country. This was the elite of the elite, the people who were lucky enough to live in Pyongyang. Probably 10% of North Koreans, experts estimate, have a sort of relatively comfortable life. But at the same time, it was interesting and important to see this other side of life because it's very, very, very hard to leave North Korea. And if you do leave, your family are often punished for it. So there's a lot of people in North Korea who perhaps don't want to be there or might want to go somewhere else, but don't really feel they have any choice. I graduated, graduated Pyongyang University of Foreign Studies. <laughs> so you speak English too? <laughs> a little. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> I think the thing we often forget when we're thinking about difficult places, whether that's a sort of extreme dictatorship like North Korea or a war zone like Syria, is people do try to sort of squeeze what enjoyment they can from life if there's any chance of that. There's a lot of ordinary people who are just trying to get on with their lives, get their children to school. They're not willing to take the risk of being captured, sent to a labour camp, perhaps executed. Or they don't want to leave all their family behind, their cousins, their parents, their siblings. Everywhere we went, people taking selfies, snapping away. I mean, in that sense, you, you sort of could have been anywhere, the, the, the amount of phones and the sort of enthusiasm for using them. North Korea is sealed, but it's not as sealed as it used to be. You know, information does come in. There's a lot of evidence that a lot of North Koreans are watching South Korean soap operas. The, the penalty for the, doing that is incredibly high. You're risking arrest, being sent to a labor camp, even execution, but people do it anyway. Some of the experts I spoke to after I left had a really interesting perspective, which was that Kim knew that the awareness of this world was reaching into North Korea, that there was some understanding, even if it was very limited, of, of what people could access in the outside world, that they had internet, that they could order things online. And so he was sort of creating a North Korean version of that society, co-opting the elite or, 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 or limiting their discontent because what they have might not be as good as what you have outside North Korea, but it, they can look at that and think, well, actually, I have a smartphone. I can take pictures. Can I see that? <laughs> I mean, that speaks, I think, to something we saw everywhere we went in Pyongyang, which is that Kim Jong-un is trying to create for a tiny elite but for an elite who are essential to his continuation in power, a sort of simulacrum of a Western consumer society.
We went to a shoe factory where there was a sort of display shelf of what looked like Western shoes. And so we asked about them. We said, well, what are these shoes doing here? And they said, oh, they were given to us by the dear leader, Kim Jong-un, to inspire us to make better shoes. We think of North Korea really as facing off with the West, as, you know, sort of attacking America, condemning America, criticizing America, not trying to copy American trainers. An unusual soul for a sports shoe. <laughs> I mean, one of the big questions people always ask is, should you even go to North Korea? Is there, and is there any point, given that it's so stage managed that you're being sort of constantly watched? So you're constantly second guessing how much of this is real, how much of this has been set up for me to see, to sort of trick me, essentially. <laughs> 다른 지역 거래소 어떤 못 찾아서 나를 찾아. They don't know actually each other, but they just gather here. But at the same time, as a journalist, I do actually feel that there is a purpose and a sense in going to places like this, and just even if all you're seeing is what they want to present you with, their choice of what to show you, the questions even that you aren't allowed to ask can be so revealing. Occasionally, we'd sort of go through a back street and, and catch a glimpse of another world, you know, a sort of homemade tractor cobbled together from parts or, or things like that. But mostly, we were being shown this very glitzy front of a country where there are still people going hungry and where there's absolutely appalling human rights abuses, one of the worst networks of sort of um, concentration and labour camps that exist anywhere in the world, one of the cruelest, harshest regimes, one of the strictest sort of political punishment systems. So it was trying to balance the chance to get at least a glimpse of North Korea, to have some sense of life there, of how Kim Jong-un was trying to change North Korea while maintaining himself in power, without, as a journalist, forgetting the fact that this was a very manufactured fund. So we were constantly trying to sort of balance those two things. Yeah.